our data and give you a bird's eye view about what's going on with the evolution of arboviruses. I, I changed a little bit uh, the um, subject. I added yellow fever because you, you need to include yellow fever to put everything into context. So as you know, my interest is mainly uh, sylvatic cycles, but this gives us a great opportunity to study the mechanisms of emergence into the uh, urban environment, but also that can be used as a model to understand what also are the mechanisms or in the urban uh, um, uh, setting. I just put these slides, this and the following one, to show you that all this, uh, the Holly the Quartet <laughs> of arboviruses, uh, they do share um, these cycles. They're mainly all exotic in nature, and as you can see, a lot of them may share the same uh, vertebrate hosts in the forest uh, in their particular location, or the same um, um, uh, mosquito horse in the uh, selvatic environment, but also in the um, uh, urban environment. And here are dengue and yellow fever. So basically, they are uh, similar, they're sharing many similarities. And I'm not going to elaborate uh, that because Graham did a great presentation yesterday about that. So when we're talking about emergence, it's not a, sing a, a single factor. It, the story is very complex, and I just put it in there to show you that uh, it, it involves specific attributes on the virus, specific attributes on the vector. Uh, environmental data may also play a, a role, sometimes minor, sometimes major, uh, and also uh, the host, okay? So, and on top of that, when you try to make any sense about these events, you need to also model all these parameters that you see to see if they're making any sense whatsoever. So that's in a nutshell. I, and I'll try to make an a sensible story about the factors that influence this emergence uh, and uh, quantify or compare the differences between Zika and the other three arboviruses. But the main, vet, uh, the main drivers of that emergence, as Gwen uh, uh, eloquently said yesterday, uh, it involves these two Aedes species, okay? Uh, the Aedes uh, aegypti uh, originated in sub-Saharan Africa and then spread throughout the world uh, with the slave trade. The opposite was with uh, Aedes albopictus, which was originated in Asia, but random events in the late 20th century led to its uh, worldwide distribution, and especially in 1985, it made uh, its debut in, uh, in North America. So this needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, so let's talk first about Zika. Many of you have seen this slide many times. I'm not going to elaborate much, but the fact is that Zika, it's one of those arboviruses that the emerged in, uh, uh, originated actually in, uh, in uh, Africa and several hundred years ago uh, made the trek across the pond, first to India and then to um, um, uh, South, uh, um, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, it stayed there for a while. We didn't have much about it. Basically, up to 2007, we had only 14 documented cases, period. Uh, and then in a span of 10 years, um, had a very interesting journey across the pond, all around. And once it reached Brazil, it just uh, all fell break loose. And this is one of the viruses that took about 200 years to make it back to its origin but completely uh, changed, okay? So um, this emergence uh, or introduction and uh, a rapid uh, emergence in the Americas is best uh, outlined here, where you can see it, uh, there was a tremendous amount of cases in the human population. And also it, it led to the emergence of new lineage right over here, this is the American lineage, but also that lineage led to back spillover, uh, back to uh, Southeast Asia and so forth. So this is very important to, um, to know. At the beginning, uh, some time ago, we put three hypotheses together how um, we can explain the emergence of Zika in such a short period of time. 
So first we thought that it may have evolved adaptation in the uh, mosquito or in the uh, vertebrate host. So these were the two main hypotheses. Um, adaptive evolution in either of two. But the third one, and most, and basically the data is gonna show that it's basically it was none of those two. It was actually, actually a stochastic process, complete randomness, which we believe it was assisted by naive population, oops, sorry. Naive populations uh, in uh, to Oceania and South uh, Pacific Islands, Micronesia, Polynesia, and so forth, which allowed its introduction into Brazil, which, as Duane said, the main driver is in the 20th century and now is rapid travel. This is what it is. It takes less than 24 hours to make the circle around the world. Uh, expansion of the tropical cities, urbanization, of course, another driver and the expanding populations of Aedes species. Uh, Aedes species, especially Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are moving to areas uh, that uh, they were uh, unheard of before and along with the mosquitoes is coming the disease which brings uh, more susceptible populations and can fuel those uh, emergency events and rapid uh, um, uh, uh, epidemics or pandemics, I may say. So basically, uh, there were um, two uh, papers that uh, suggested recently that uh, uh, first of all there is uh, they were suggesting that there is evidence that there was uh, an adaptive evolution event occurred uh, in the PRM envelope of the gene to allow better adaptation for infectivity and transmissibility in Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And then another report uh, shortly thereafter suggested that there was another mutation in the PRM envelope to suggest that that was the main cause of microcephaly. I might add that I'm quite skeptical about those two reports for a simple reason. Uh, this report, if you read through uh, this paper, you can, you're going to see that this individual, they tested several hundred pools of mosquitoes to see a two-fold difference, uh, which is extremely minuscule to, uh, to um, justify such a rapid uh, emergence uh, and infectivity in mosquitoes. And I'm going to show you data that indicate that uh, the Asian and American lineage in Aedes aegypti populations and Albopictus is rather refractory. Um, so uh, I might also say that uh, another group in the United States obtained the same, uh, the same viruses, uh, the same uh, mosquito eggs, they reared them in the laboratory and they were not able to replicate those data. Uh, I know uh, a recent paper a couple of days ago suggested that it doesn't matter what you do, the artificial containers that you use in the lab, you know, the microbiome after a while, after even the first uh, passage is equalized, so it doesn't make a difference. Uh, the issue is that, you know, um, these kind of studies, they can serve only as a model, as a guidance. What is happening in nature is, of course, completely different. We cannot control the microbiome, but there are ways that actually we can simulate uh, natural artificial environments in, in the lab. But this is something that you need to bear in mind. Now, this one, again, it does not explain, and as Mauricio say, that uh, uh, that was shown also in mice, and also the uh, mutation, it's not present in the Brazilian population. Uh, these studies were done with the Asian uh, lineage. So uh, I, I think when you read uh, data like this, you need to take them with a, a grain of salt. You need to also be, a, uh, to wait to evaluate them once they have been independently confirmed by other labs. And this is a common phenomenon that, uh, at least with the Zika, we have seen it uh, several times that, uh, uh, you know, publications in top tier journals uh, sway not only the scientific opinion, but also the public opinion with uh, uh, unforeseen results such as panic, as um, we have seen earlier in Brazil uh, with the vaccine and so forth. So we need to be a little bit more uh, guided in our evaluations when we see results like this. So when we did uh, about a year and a half ago, um, we, we wanted to see how 
various populations of mosquitoes may be able to infect and transmit the virus. We did several, um, uh, several experiments uh, that we utilized Aedes aegypti mosquitoes from several countries. We used uh, mosquitoes from Salvador. We used from the Dominican Republic. Um, this is the Rio Grande Valley and several other locations, but I, I'm not gonna put it here. The gist of those experiments was that A, the African strain, okay, it's a lot hotter. Hot means able to infect and disseminate in all populations of mosquitoes. But if you, oops, if you look closer, at least with artificial, artificial uh, blood meals, you can see that uh, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes from Salvador are basically refractory. The Dominican Republic are uh, the most um, uh, the, bo uh, the most uh, permissive, and of course in the Rio Grande Valley, um, uh, they are somewhere in between. One important aspect to uh, say is that the natural viremia levels in humans, they have been detected to be about three logs, which it comes in contrast because you can see here, we did close to five logs, close to six logs, and seven logs. So how is it possible if the natural viremia reaches those low levels, those mosquitoes can be uh, infected. And I'm gonna show you data indicating that artificial blood meal experiments basically, uh, they're completely uninformative and misguiding. Um, oops, wrong way. Okay, the other thing that uh, also, it has become an extremely controversial um, uh, subject and it, uh, it refuses to die is the fact, not the fact, is the notion that uh, Culex quinquefasciatus mosquitoes may act as a potential vector. Um, I, I, I'm not sure this is, it should have been an issue to begin with because most of the, these papers, there is a slew of papers that indicate that they suggest that this is the case, but if you read them closely, uh, most of the detections was done by qPCR, and as you can see here, the CT values are atrocious. Uh, anyone who does normal qPCR knows that you know the limit of detection is about a CT value of 33. Uh, several uh, of the titers that they supposedly detected in there with questionable methods are uh, several logs in magnitude lower than transmission, uh, that what has been observed in transmission competent Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Now, some of them, some of them may be competent for that, but that has not, I have not seen a paper anywhere that shows that conclusively, or it has not been demonstrated based on human serial biting. This is the golden or, you know, the holy grail in showing something like that. And as you can see here, there are uh, others uh, that they say that, but also uh, I, I chose to put up here uh, just a small subset of the papers that they have been published to refute that notion that Culex kicking fasciatus is a competent vector. Um, so I, I think as a scientific community, we need to put that to rest. If there is enough uh, uh, evidence out there that may not support that. And we need to be a little bit more careful when we make conclusions like that. Now, coming back to the notion that I told you that uh, a, a mosquito uh, artificial blood meals are completely uninformative, uh, we decided to do uh, an experiment, um, you know, so if we take a A129 mice that we do know what the viremia is at certain days post-infection. So we do know uh, that it's reproducible that a day two, uh, one post-infection, we have six, seven logs and then goes down logarithmically. So if we infect, if we let mosquito cohorts feed on those viremic mice at a certain day, we do know, we do know also the viremia that it is in the host, but also what it has been shown here, contrary to artificial data, is that um, uh, we do see infection, we do see dissemination uh, in a natural blood meal, that is from a, a viremic individual, as early as seven days, 
and about 50% uh, of those uh, mosquito populations uh, show uh, mosquito, I mean, virus in the saliva at about 14 days post-infection. So when we are trying to understand those and make the broad inferences about the evolution of those or the transmissibility of those mosquitoes, we need to put it into context. Otherwise, we just perpetuating false notions and we go down to blind alleys. And with this experiment also with, not, uh, with mosquito, uh, I mean, uh, animals infected with, uh, with uh, Zika and fed them various population of Culex king quimfasciatus, we were unable to demonstrate not only uh, infections but dissemination, okay? So we need to be very careful about that. Um, now, in the work that we done back in, uh, in 2015 in Chiapas, we were the first group to show that Aedes aegypti, natural uh, populations of Aedes aegypti are responsible for transmission of the virus in several communities in the state of Chiapas. But we did not find any evidence of um, engorged Culex quinquefasciatus that they were capable of transmitting um, uh, disease or no disease, I'm sorry, not being able to be infected with the virus. So I think that should be able to, uh, to lay it into rest that uh, uh, Stegomyia species are the main drivers of dissemination into the environment. Um, so Mauricio has uh, uh, dealt with that. Uh, uh, so the other thing that I want to say uh, about that is that uh, um, the uh, group from Puerto Rico, Carlos, was able to show that in, uh, in um, um, macaques. So this was macaques that they were infected with dengue and then were allowed to be infected with Zika uh, 14 to 16 months uh, post-infection uh, with dengue. Which also, this comes into, into play what we are seeing in a natural environment in natural infection or end artificial infections of uh, non-human primates with yellow fever back in the 70s when Henderson and Monath did those experiments and actually it's gonna be the uh, last slide that uh, I'm gonna revisit that, what is happening on the sylvatic cycle and how this can be extrapolated also in the urban transmission cycle, just to try to make sense how these viruses move around, what are the mechanisms of emergence we basically we know nothing about it to this day. Um, if we move into chikungunya, this is another African virus. Uh, and as you know, there are three lineages. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, it made it out, uh, out of Africa. Uh, it uh, moved into Asia. It lurked there for several hundred years. Uh, we don't have any evidence of exotic transmission cycle in in Southeast Asia, although a report back in from the early 2000s, late 19, uh, 1990s, uh, provided some sort of serologic evidence, but without a smoking gun that is isolation of the virus, it's only speculation. Um, so uh, this virus uh, made out again uh, in, uh, in the early 2000s in, in um, uh, in the Indian Ocean, and I'm gonna show you some data that actually the chikungunya is the poster child that actually we have genetic evidence to indicate that a single mutation is, is solely responsible for the increased infectivity in one of the vectors that allowed the rapid expansion in new geographic regions, but also the higher um, uh, you know, uh, disseminations into humans that led to these huge epidemics. Uh, so this virus, uh, oops, it's going on. Okay, so the virus also made it, uh, there are two events, introduction events that occurred of the Asian uh, lineage uh, into the Americas, but also uh, there was a couple of years later, there was also the African lineage that also made it in the Americas. So we have now a case here in the Western Hemisphere that we have co-circulation of both those lineages. Um, so this is quite interesting. Now, uh, as I said, there is a single mutation that allowed this 
expansion into a new vector um, that led to much higher levels of infectivity and transmission, okay, which led to this rapid um, uh, geographic expansion and the higher in infectivity into humans. And that is best described in here. This is all this, uh, the work of uh, Kostya Chacharkin, who used to be a postdoc in Scott Weaver's lab. And actually, Scott is the one that actually led this. Uh, it has been a leader on this for several years. Uh, and as you can see here, the data, uh, this uh, A26 uh, to valine is responsible for a 40-fold increase uh, in the fitness for Aedes albopictus infection. What also is uh, important to say is that this is not the only uh, mutation that may be responsible. There are other also single mutations or synergistic mutations that may have led to increased fitness, but not to that level that uh, you, you have seen with this single mutation. So when this mutation is being put into the Asian lineage, it has absolutely no effect, okay? So this is the first conclusive evidence that genetic changes in, in the virus have a tremendous effect, not only in the expansion of vector host, vector host range, but also dissemination, geographic dissemination which is, uh, we have not seen it yet with Zika. Um, okay, so let's move into dengue. I'm not gonna elaborate uh, that a lot. Uh, Duane gave a, a very good overview yesterday. I just want to remind you that it's one of the most important arboviral diseases in the world, close to half or a third of the human population is at risk of infection. Um, and as Duane said, rapid urbanization, uh, travel, uh, movement of people, and so forth lend to the current situation that we do see uh, a roaring pandemic in the tropics. And as the climate gets warmer, uh, you know, we do have accidental travel-related infections to these areas uh, about uh, six to seven years ago. After an absence of several uh, decades, we do see uh, a sustained autochthonous transmission in southern Florida, and we have seen it also uh, somewhere in the northern Argentina. So, you know, we need to be aware that the environment also may play a vector in this geographic expansion, and also that may play ultimately a role in the evolution of those viruses as new immunologically naive people are coming into contact with the virus, which may have a direct effect in, in, uh, in terms of selective pressures in the genome and so forth. And I'm not gonna go much into uh, quasi-species here or interagenic variation. It's a completely different topic than this. Okay, um, so in terms of the evolution, uh, again, Southeast Asia, you know, um, I'm not gonna go in much into that, but uh, probably, uh, uh, immune enhancement may have to do something with selection of more virulent strains like the, den the Asian dengue two strain and so forth. Uh, that led to tremendous diversity. Now, uh, one point that I want to make about this and I'll move quite fast is that, yes, we do have a tremendous diversity in all serotypes, but we need to be also cognizant about uh, paradigm shifting. So if, uh, if uh, the, the dogma uh, was saying that all these viruses are, are serotypically different, that's correct. You know, you do see genetically they, um, they populate uh, distinct areas, okay? But uh, serologically, they do not. Actually, there is a continuum that overlaps into different serotypes. So we need to be cognizant about that, which may also explain how these viruses ultimately evolve. Um, in worth of 10 years, uh, 15 years uh, of, of work, what we have shown experimentally is with dengue, which is the golden standard of uh, studying the adaptation and evolution of these viruses, is basically there is no adaptation like Zika of emergence in either the vector or vertebrate host. Uh, the evolutionary processes at the genome in both non-human primates and uh, humans are similar, um, and those viruses are readily um, emerging. So emergence from the sylvatic environment can happen at any given time and before we have seen it with yellow fever. 
Um, and I'm going to skip for the yellow fever since we discussed that. So if you compare what is happening with those viruses, yellow fever was originated in Zika, emerged into the urban cycle following the domestication of Aedes aegypti, and as Duran said, transport with a, a, a slave trade uh, led it to new uh, environments in the Americas where they established a selvatic transmission cycle. We have not seen it in Asia. The opposite is with dengue viruses originated in Southeast Asia. They move throughout the world, but there is only a single focus of exotic uh, dengue, and this is with the second serotype in, in, in Western Africa. Chikungunya also originated in Africa, moved throughout the world with similar reasons. Uh, but uh, we don't see an enzootic sylvatic cycle in either Asia or uh, in the Americas. So here is where we are. This is the score, okay, if you put it in a nutshell, okay? Um, so uh, I just want to uh, bring you this, some of the data, and actually, Dwayne, yesterday I misspoke, okay? I'm just going to bring you that. Uh, about the heterologous immunity uh, in uh, non-human primates. It's actually protective. There is a difference in the type of viruses that they are protective. For example, in rhesus macaques, West Nile, Banzi, and Zika are not protective against yellow fever challenge, but whether if you have Wesselbron and Zika uh, pre-exposure in vervet monkeys, then you are protected for subsequent infection to yellow fever. So there is a heterologous uh, type, not all immunity to flavivirus is the same, they can lead to different results, but not enhancement, okay? And in the case of Brazil, we do know that we have a bunch of viruses, some of them they are very well known, some of them are rather obscure, we don't know which one is going to make, and anyone who can tell you that this one is, you know, this virus and this one virus has a uh, probability of, uh, of uh, getting, um, uh, you know, the next one, it's highly unlikely. It's a completely random event which we, not, uh, we do not control. So now what? We, we need to do comprehensive ecological and epidemiological studies, as Duane said yesterday. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but you know, look, if you don't even find uh, uh, sylvatic cycles in the new world where this virus is made, that's not a waste of money, okay? Because this is what the funding agents say. It's a waste of money. It's a fishing expedition. What you're going to learn out of that is the elucidation of the underlying reasons would that enhance or prevent that establishment of the enzootic cycle. And this has tremendous implications in the overall emergence. Lastly, I want to give credit to my heroes that they led me to be who I am. First is Scott Weaver. Here is with Bob Teth in the jungles of Peru looking for sylvatic virus, Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus. Scott was the one who rescued me from industry and brought me back to academia and made me an arbovirologist. And of course, Albert Rudnick. Without him, I would never had an interest in exotic sylvatic cycles. He is the one that influenced most of my scientific life in terms of moving into sylvatic transmission cycles. So of course, various other collaborators that I cannot list all of them in here, and of course, historical funding that uh, supported both dengue, chikungunya, and Zika research. Thank you. <laughs>